Hey folks, welcome to uh, Biomass episode 78. Uh, we have, as usual, kind of a, an interesting lineup of folks for you to talk to you tonight, or really for us to talk and for you to listen here on the on the stream or slash podcast, since tonight we may or may not be streaming, but we will always be podcasting. That should make it for an interesting show. Uh, so, as usual, we are spread across a whole lot of different time zones. And we are uh, like we actually have a little bit of international flavor tonight, which is kind of cool. So we wanted to, uh, you know, kick it off with a little bit of a, a little bit of different different discussion here here and there on some uh, some random topics. But we will talk a little bit about some actions on the Eve side that, believe it or not, may have actually had their kind of uh, uh, start point in the minds of the CCP dev dev team from either game that actually came from some notes in the dust form. It'll be kind of interesting, and it'll probably lead us down a, a, a few rat holes we can discuss about how things work in Dust and games in general to a degree. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and knock out some uh, introductions here for the show tonight. So let's see. Let's go with top of the list, Sarizel. Yeah, um, I'm Sarizel. I'm a member of, uh, or was a member of the CPM, and I am a co-host here on the show. Outstanding. Mr. Bate. Hey everybody, what's up? I'm, I'm Awa Bate. I'm a member of the Incorruptibles Corporation and a writer for the Biomast blog. Outstanding. Mr. Havoc. Hey guys, uh, Bam here. I'm stuck in a host pop, so if I sound a bit crap, uh, sorry. Well said. And Mr. Carbonite. Hi, I'm Darth Carbonite, member of CPM2. Verbose as always. Uh, Jadik Menheim. Hello, I'm Jadik Menaheim, CEO of the Zerg Consortium Corporation Emporium. All righty then, and I'm Jason Larison. I'm one of the purveyors of the uh, Biomass pod podcast. I do almost no work, basically no work, on the Biomass.net website, which mostly falls to uh, one each Pokey Draven and Sriazel, and a bit to Mr. Bate, who is one of our uh, one of our key contributors and in, in case you haven't noticed pokey who is our normal kind of third amigo of the three amigos if you will uh, he's normally the martin short of the three amigos uh, he is out tonight since he is uh, he volunteers his family volunteers and runs a uh, uh, like a haunted house for for kids in their neighborhood or really in their city so to speak so it's it's the season of haunting so he is out for the next week or two we might Scaring actually just, yeah, we just, might we, we might actually change our show time to get him back on the show, but he is scaring people. And if you ever get a chance to meet Pokey, he's like 6'9 and uh, 150 pounds in real life. He looks like a, a fucking scarecrow anyway, so it, it's probably not a big stretch for him. Uh, no pun intended. So <laughs> without further ado, let's uh, let's go ahead and kick off our first kind of key topic. What what we've seen here in the very very recent past is. Um, there is a topic of discussion on the Eve side, reference skill points and how do you and a way to get skill points relatively rapidly if you're a player. That is creating a, a very large discussion. I think it, it's well past 50 pages uh, on the the base forum post. I think it was over side. 100, like as of like three days ago. Yeah, it, it hit 50 pages as fast as anything I've seen like in the last few years. So it, it's if. For those of you that know Eve Online, which is sort of the, you know, kind of in the genetic family of, of how Dust 514 and, and Valkyrie work, the long story short there is that it is a very much a long term game where skill points and the maturation of a character is definitely something that you have to do in basically real time. You can't really power level your way through it like you can with a lot of other games. So SP is often a very, very direct marker of, of the seniority or age of a character uh, in the game in a way that it is very different from, I think, pretty much any other RPG or MMO that I am aware of uh, in the way that you accrue skill, which then allows you to fit into different ships, utilize different things, have different, different capabilities within the game. So... There, there's a proposal that, and Jadik, please stop me if I get this wrong, but it sounds like you can purchase a module or a thing for ARM, which is basically the, you know, a real money equivalent. It's a direct transfer of real money to ARM. Uh, so you would purchase this this ticket or this uh, module or item. It's kind of undefined right now that allows you to remove a certain amount of skill points from your your player character or one of the player characters that you own and then resale that 
to other players directly. So kind of the, the very rough analogy would be scooping out some brain matter that you somehow didn't think you needed, you know, like let's say you're a 50 million SP character and you scoop out 10 million worth of SP. These numbers are not to scale, by the way, it is just purely for, uh, uh, for the analogy. Once you, you take that, you, you can then resale your blank SP or your, uh, package of SP out to other people to okay. figure out what the what the market value of that is, and then they basically buy it from you, and then they inject it. I, I guess similar to the way you do a skill book now, you inject it into your character or use the ticket on your character, and then it gives them an instant patch of however much SP that you bought. So there are a lot of uh, a, a lot of things kicking around on this one now. A couple things. Yes, in, in EVE Online, but not in Dust, you can purchase a character. Like, And it is a vetted and known process and system within the game. You can purchase a character from the Character Bazaar that's on the EVO forums uh, for however much in-game currency. The normal way people do this is they use real money, buy Plex, sell it for ISK, take the ISK, uh, and then purchase a character. And, and it could be, you're talking, you know, anywhere from probably 30 or 40 bucks worth of real money up to several hundred uh, easily, if not more, depending on the type of character and, and how rare some of the skills are because of the length of time it takes you to train them. So there's a very real market for player market for people that farm alts and stuff like that and purely just sell them you know, as part of their business model that they use in EVE. So this would have a fairly, uh, if not a direct impact on it, it would have a significant uh, secondary impact on it in terms of what a player market might look like in the future. So I think that kind of sets the stage. And one thing I'd like to do is open the, open the discussion up with Jadek Menheim actually talking a little bit about the proposal that he made on the Dust Forums quite a while ago that kind of sounds suspiciously like this one. So, Jake, if you don't mind, could you give us a quick uh, rundown on what your proposal was? Oh, thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, I believe yeah this was back in April of um, that yeah of this year that I would wrote up a proposal uh, thanks to some discussion with um, some other players and it kind of came to the idea that we could um, extract skill points uh, piecemeal and then give those to other players but the the thing with eve and dust is dust kind of has its own issues with extracting passive points so you'd have to go to an active system in order to not uh run into issues with alt farms of passive uh psn accounts but i'm kind of digressing um the the thing that really struck me is um oh, uh kind of losing myself here um, what I would like to, I guess, comment on is how this system really it feels like a like a step up from the current character bizarre system that they've they've put forward. Like I guess you could say character bizarre two point It's uh, kind of addressing an issue that um, the character bizarre is this kind of third party thing that's almost relegated to the form. It's not within the game itself, and the eve developers are looking to bring that in a way into the game for more people to identify and be able to interact with in a more streamlined way um and i guess what they put forward is it, it, it feels like a good step the the initial numbers as uh as i'm reading it right now the uh the packet will take out uh fifty thousand skill points and it, as you said it costs orum to buy this little skill extractor and in order to put it in you have to sell it or give it to another player and the amount that you can put into another person is dependent on how many skill points they have in their their mind already so it really benefits younger skill point players and it uh the diminishing returns of plugging it into higher and higher skill point players really begins to drop off as you go up the uh the ladder there and what that seems to do is it protects um, the, the investment of these um, long-time e-players that have built up lots of skill points over the years by just being um, subscribing members for how many years they've been in the system. But it also, 
I would say helps get new players into the game quicker. Um, duh. Doing what, uh, like you could gift your friend some skill points from your head or um, kind of use it as a corporation system where you can build uh, skill packets to train up newbies or something to kind of help complement your um, your game time by if you're like a long time player, take out some skill points, make some ISK on the side, help with that toward a plex um, for your own game time. But yeah, the uh, the skill points really affect um, newer players the best because there's um, less uh, less loss from those packets. Uh, uh, read the numbers here. Uh, zero to five million skill points. Um, you don't lose any skill points when you're plugging it in. That 500,000 unallocated goes in immediately. From five to 50 million skill points, um, you have a plug-in of 400,000 unallocated skill points. And from 50 to 80 million, it's 200,000. And above 80 million, you're getting a really low of um, 50,000 unallocated skill points. So if you're trying to hoard all these skill packets, you're going to have a really difficult time um, one, finding sellers who want to give all these skill packets and to the the ISK amount that's going to cost you to raise that. So even the, the filthy space rich is going to take them a while to get uh, a fully like maxed out SP character, even if that's possible. But yeah, there's a there's a lot of different things to kind of dovetail and talk about from here. So I guess anybody have any thoughts on this? Well, I think um, I am much less against it than many EVE players are. Um, I think the biggest thing is um, EVE players kind of have like almost a, a, a religious fascination with the way EVE has worked before. And I think that, I think that uh, you know, EVE has never been friendly to new players and it needs to get much better. And their player count is not going to support it not getting better. And... Uh, I, I think that there it's time to slay some sacred cows um, in the Eve design, if that's what it takes to get more people into it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay there. We had a little bit of silence. Uh, looks like we had an audio glitch. Everybody back online? Yep, 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 we're good. Okay, well, hopefully nobody on the recording will, will actually hear that. It'll probably be a bit of a blip, but shouldn't be a problem. Jadik, where were you at, man? I'm sorry I cut out about two minutes ago. Uh, kind of rambling through some bits here, but... Uh... Uh, it's it's more the the proposal is a way to help kind of bring in the third party sk like skill character bazaar system into the game in a way that is accessible to a lot of people to be able to uh, extract skill points from say mining skills they're never going to use anymore to put into uh, things that maybe in their own character that they want or sell that to someone or gift it to someone or use it as part of like a recruitment doctrine for new players um, even though it might be cost prohibitive to do that it might be some like kind of like a reward system per se but in a way it also kind of really helps something that that maybe a lot of new players are getting turned off by where they come into the game and they don't they they want to play with their friends who are already in eve but in order to really be viable, they can't use their own starting character. They have to buy someone from the market. Like, say, like, like YOLO Swaggins XXX, kind of this minor character maybe that has a sketchy corporation history. And it's something that that person coming into EVE doesn't really have an emotional investment in. So they come into the game with this character that they've really never used before. It's, it's viable, but it doesn't have their experiences, their um, personality invested into that character that is an extension by way of themselves into the game, which might be kind of harmful for getting like a long-term customer invested. Um, you know, um, I think one of the comments that, the, that we saw some of the EVE devs make, what, it was based on, I don't know if it was just anecdotal or if there was an actual survey behind it or whatever, but they kind of mentioned exactly what you said there in that... Um, you know, players that buy a character off of the bazaar, which again can can be not insignificant in terms of the amount of real life money um, that they because they don't have like an actual attachment to the character, and 
by extension, like a more visceral attachment. Yeah, it's, yeah through the visceral word then or only for Soraya. Um, so you don't have like an emotional, you know, attachment to the game per se. Unlike if you've got a character, at your aka your main or whatever that you've personally invested time in, you've done all the work, you know, you you actually created it and named it what you wanted and made it look like how you wanted it and all that kind of stuff. That there's a, um, I think it's easier for people to kind of cut their losses and leave because they don't have the personal investment in it. Um, and I think this is a way that they were trying to, to get people more options for um, helping their main character out to keep that sort of emotional connection to the game itself while they were building social networks inside the game. And I think that's actually by extension, like, you know, the far end of the, the spectrum is when you see the longtime Eve veterans, like the, you know, 100 million plus skill point crowd, which is, is fairly attainable, but it does take you several years to do that. Um, uh, it that's where you get a lot of their uh, ferocity about this kind of thing is because they do have a deeper emotional attachment to it. Because if you think about it, they've been messing around with the same character that they that they've had for many years, uh, and in Dust you could have some characters that are you know relatively old actually if you think about it if they were around during the beta. Uh, so it, I could see where some of the uh, the hot topic discussions are coming from. Now, I guess one of the questions I was having, I think you mentioned that the, now the numbers that they've been throwing around are somewhere around 50,000 skill points per packet, right? Well, five, 500,000. 500,000. Okay, that, that makes a hell of a lot more sense. Um, for just like for a frame of reference, like generally in, in EVE and in Dust, things work on like a, a five level scale. So a, a skill will have levels one through five and it costs X amount of skill points. Uh, to go through each level and each skill can have like a, uh, a rank. So like a rank one skill, it would for, you know, basically 300,000 SP, you can max that skill out. And that'll be something really, really basic, like something that everybody's got to use and need and supplies a solid bonus. Um, the higher end stuff, like when you get into really advanced uh, like ships or really advanced weapon systems or, you know, X, Y, and Z type of technical things in the game, you can have like 16x skills, if I'm not mistaken, which is, that's like flying a Titan, like kind of the end game sort of stuff. And that takes forever to accumulate the skill points because the way it works in EVE is you, you accumulate the skill points um, in real time, basically. And you can modify that based on some, uh, like implants you can buy and stuff like that, which are very, very fragile because when you die, the, the implant dies with you. Uh, so th there are ways to accelerate what you're doing, but not, not a whole lot, you know, in the grand scheme of things. If you're playing the long game, it'll make sense. But if you're playing the short game or, or you're a newer player, it's very little you can do to accelerate your process until now. So 500,000 sounds pretty reasonable. Uh, if you're a new player, that would be a, pretty legitimate bump and give you some access to some things, I think, uh, relatively quickly. I was, when I first read it, I kind of thought it was more along the lines of you pay X amount of ORM and get, you know, up to however much real money you were going to spend on it, an injective skill. So in theory, you could drop enough money to create a, you know, a 30 million skill point player, which is a pretty well-rounded player, or at least a good specialist, you know, character uh, for anything you want to do in EVE. Um, and you could kind of do that out of jump street, you know, but it's not quite, that's that, that's not quite how it's looking. It's more of a, uh, an in-game economy based on brain matter is what it sort of sounds like. Is that, is that about a fair statement? Yeah. Because I mean, you're, you're not really paying outright to get skill points. You're paying another player who has essentially mined that in his head or his, yeah. And then, then you buy that from that person and it's, it's kind of, the market will level out after a while based on like seller and buyer demand. So it's kind of, it seems like a it, in keeping with core E principles. Well, one of the, you know, for kind of the, the, the science fiction nerd crew, one of the, the things I heard, it was, I think it was a really good analogy. If you've ever read any William Gibson cyber, uh, kind of cyberpunk novels or seen the movie Johnny Mnemonic, you know, mm -hmm. you'll kind yeah. of counter reuse thing. It would be basically, um, like if you excised a certain 
if you could somehow isolate a certain set of reflexes skilled or learned memory and you sold that off, you lost that after you sold it, but then somebody could take it and basically download that. So it's kind of the kind of a, a combination of I'm going to blend two Keanu Reeves movies here. So it would be a bit like the Johnny Mnemonic where he, he lost a lot of his memory in order to gain something back like storage space in his head or whatever. Uh, and a bit like the matrix where he downloaded a skill set, like, you know, like the, I, the infamous, I know Kung Fu scene. Well, where, where the, in this sort of analogy, where that would have come from is somebody who actually learned Kung Fu and then volunteered to give up those X amount of years of training in their head over to somebody else for a small nominal fee. So that it, it I think it would be kind of, a, it's a neat idea. I just, I would be curious to see how viable it really is. Cause it, again, even does don't exactly correlate to each other in terms of how fast you can be useful because technically a new player in dust, while they will get jobbed quite heavily, um, they, you can be value added, I think much quicker in dust than you can in Eve. Does that sound about fair guys? Yeah, I would say so. It's going to be abused. There's going to be a loophole somewhere along the line, and it's going to be abused. The one thing oh, Dust Eve players are known for is finding these loopholes and literally abusing the living crap out of it. That's yeah. the only thing I see with this. There's going to be a loophole somewhere. Gonna love this. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes, yes, yes. Question is, how long uh, will it take before, you know, if the system does drop, how long will it take before somebody finds an exploit? Oh, the, well, oh, dude, the egg is a it before it hits. <laughs> Like if they, because if you think about it, if if they put it, because what they normally do is they put the mechanics and the quant, the numbers down, like you know, well before like a week or more before um, the thing goes live, somebody will figure out a way to min max it. Some dude like Jadek probably oh, will figure yeah. it out. Okay. So nine times out of ten, when something will hit in either Dust or Eve, a a working viable set of you know like th you could have two or three courses of action as a player on how to min max or optimize or you know break or abuse or take advantage of a thing uh think of a guy like kane sparrow when they talk about any changes to pc back in the day he one he had insider trading knowledge which i you know i like kane a lot and he's a good dude but let's make no bones about it he he, he would he would bend that shit to his own will. So he was already working out the ways that you could um, you could take advantage of a system and guys like him, you know, or like Jadik, you know, and I say that with all, all respect and humor <laughs> that, that one would would uh, would want to use in a game. So uh, I guess my, my general question, do any more saved rounds on uh, the thoughts of SP purchasing or transfers before we move on to another topic? Just one thing that would be interesting to have to factor in is they'll probably have to put like a bio, like a biomass counter safety feature on this because hacked accounts, you might run into people getting hacked and having all their SP dro like dropped off if there's not some sort of <laughs> incremental stopgap for like extracting uh, skill points at a time. That would be pretty cool, actually. Also I'm not. Might be. <laughs> it might be pretty nifty to like run into people in space and they hold your super cap hostage and then they blow it either they blow it up or you give them five months of SP. Oh, I could totally see that happening. I could absolutely see that happening. But again, it's down to regulation. If CGP don't regulate the shit properly, it's gonna get out of hand pretty quickly. Yeah, it's one thing to take ISK from somebody, you know, which happens fairly regularly in the game. Uh, it will be. It's a kind of a different thing when you're taking SP. So I, I suspect BAM's onto something. What they'll end up doing is there'll be some protective measures against some of that. Although I'm not really sure exactly how you could do it. Uh, it like I said, somebody needs to think through think this through fairly well. And I'm pretty sure this guy's at CCPR. But oh, by the way, here's an interesting little, little tip for you. Uh, CCP rarely puts anything like that out on the forms that they aren't about 85, 90% of the way there and are just kind of getting, basically they're knocking the rough edges off, so to speak, with some polish or some feedback, but it's going in. I have not yet seen anything that they released like that that didn't go in uh, into a patch in some form or fashion, either in a good way or a bad way. So we'll, uh, 
we'll see kind of we'll kind of see how this one this one fleshes out, I guess. Now, uh, if if you guys don't mind, I do actually want to query one of our guests about something. Uh, so, Bam, you actually kind of got to hang out with a few people over in uh, CCP Newcastle here pretty recently, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. So, uh, this is one of these kind of interesting things where, you know, since Bam's a, a uh, one of our European brothers over there, he gets a, a little bit more ready access to, or at least his potential access to bumping into CCP folks and having a beer with them tends to be a little bit different uh, than most other people's uh, or at least most, uh, most North American folks outside of going to like an E Vegas or something like this. Was this a player meetup or was this random chance encounter? How did you guys link up? Well, believe it or not, I did not stalk anybody. I promise this now. Right. Um, Are you sure was, about that? No, dude, def, guarantee. Promise, hands down, swear. I didn't stalk anyone. I'm, I'm fairly for too long. There's going to be some kind of <laughs> TV video of you at some point. <laughs> no, I was actually, um, what was it? I was actually invited out to go um, have a few drinks with uh, a few of the devs in a uh, pub. Uh, with some of the, you know, CCP Newcastle dev guys, and I did not decline. I went out, had a few pints, and I learned a lot. Had a great time, and yeah, yeah, good times, good times. That's pretty Work good. Woke up now. with a sore head, yes, but it was good times. Yeah. Well, that's usually an indicator of a good time. Now, even New now CCP Newcastle is pre predominantly where they work on Valkyrie, I believe, right? Uh, yes, they work on um, E Valkyrie at CCP Newcastle. Yes. Okay. So, well, I'm just kind of curious, and, and all this, by the way, is all kind of public knowledge stuff, and, and I mean, I've seen some of the CCP devs throwing this out on Twitter, too. Uh, very interesting when, when it looked like, a, a to me, an impromptu player, uh, player gathering, player meeting, but it looked like you guys had a really good time. Now, I think, in all fairness here, um, for folks that, you know, haven't been around in a while or maybe are new to the show, Bam Havoc is a well-known YouTuber uh, and particularly was had a very, very lively stream of, uh, of dust videos for a long time. And I think, I think it would be fair to say, Bam, that, that you kind of got, uh, fairly soured on the game, or at least the, the things going on around the game for a while post the Rouge wedding, along with a lot of us, frankly. Uh, but it sounded just in our conversations prior to the show, it sounded like you, you got a little bit more, a little bit different lens on things now about how CCP, uh, was working, uh, particularly after your engagement with some of the folks from Newcastle. If, do you mind kind of uh, teeing that up a little bit and letting us know kind of where your thoughts are on CCP right now? Okay, well, look, um, as before, I was invited out to uh, have a few points and so on and just got talking with some of the devs. And, you know, ultimately I realized that during conversations, I forget that these guys are just people. You know, they're gamers like you and me. You know, they, they play Magic the Gathering and Warhammer 40k and you know, they're currently playing Witcher 3 right now. And it's very humbling to think that these people are just like us. They want to make awesome games. And the fact that it's not the developers that are doing these things in Dust, it's other people. So that actually made me sort of think a bit differently rather than the negative things. And I won't lie, I've been, I'm the salt, one of the saltiest, oldest, rottenest, vilest people out there when it comes to the dust forums I, I won't make any bones about it and also tinfoil a lot and yeah a lot of tinfoil super kept titan class tinfoil there but yeah after talking to these guys and getting to meet the people behind the uh the, you know the ccp handle um i have a different view of things and yeah yeah i drank some of the kool-aid the kool-aid made sense so yeah it, yeah i can't really say much more than that dude yeah but i had a, no, I had a good time um, met a lot of people, had a good time, talked to these guys, you know, it's, the devs have to do what the devs have to do. In the day, it's a job, they have to do the job, you know, that's, that's basically it. Um, it's not them that do the bits, it's other people, so, yeah. I don't really know what to say, dude. Now, it's just, I, guess, I want to say, but I can't really. No, no, that's not, no problem. So now, I guess my general question is, like, when you drank some of the Kool-Aid, did you have, like, the, like, 64-ounce Big Gulp Denny Fleetfoot size Kool-Aid drink, or... Something a little smaller. Oh, uh, no, dude. I had a uh, half pint of what they call, uh, I think it's, uh, what, the, what they call it, Farmer's Friend or something. Delicious cider. Also had some uh, some sort of perry that was utterly out of this world. Beautiful stuff. I uh, didn't actually drink any Kool-Aid. It was more like ciders and beers, dude. 
that, that I was, I was look, I went out more for a good time rather than a um, a full on discussion of you know questions and and haranguing these poor guys who also believe it's not they just finished work coincidentally and come out for a pint. You know, I just I want to have a good time. They want to have a good time. It was all about enjoying the side of the beer, the moment. You know, the company. It was it was great. It was a good giggle. Good that's laugh. a good that's a, a good deal. I, I'm actually I'm I'm really glad you kind of you kind of shared that because this is. One of the interesting things, uh, and, and I've, I've actually, over the course of doing this podcast uh, for a little bit more than a year, I've gotten to know a few actual people that, that do actual game work and have corresponded with a few or talked to a couple. And, and it is something that a lot of people tend to forget. Normally, the people that make games got into that business because they love games. You know, they're gamers. Uh, and nobody wants to, to produce something bad. Nobody wants to... Nobody, very few of the people that make games that are actually the makers, designers, and developers of games want something to be a poor experience for for customers because mostly their customers are other gamers uh, just like them. And they, they don't like it when they've got burned in the past, so they try not to do that. But it is a business, and there are decisions that get made, get, that, you know, get made. So, you know, things things happen, and frankly, you know, Sometimes you make customer decisions or sometimes you make business decisions. It works both ways. So really glad that you were able to kind of share that a little bit, Bam. And like I said, if you ever get a chance to go to one of the actual EVE meetups, uh, even if you're not an EVE player and you're like a Dust player and you want to like uh, kind of meet some of these people, it's pretty cool. I do, I do highly encourage people to go to at least one sort of game meetup like that. Um, EVE, you can find a ton of them for EVE. Uh, and that might be a good segue into some things if you've ever dabbled in the game. But it's a it's a cool experience when you get to kind of put your know, faces to the voices you hear on comms, or you actually get to meet some of the devs that uh, you know build the sort of quote unquote build the spaceships and the lasers that you shoot. But I do highly recommend that. So just curious, any thoughts, guys? Any? interesting tallies that you had or uh, encounters with uh, CCP folks at uh, either live events or here and there that are really game developers in general that may have changed your mind about a game in particular or how things are done in the gaming industry. I'll kind of open this up to probably Soraya and Darth since you guys actually either served or are serving on a, uh, a an elected council that actually deals with developers. Uh, what do you guys think? I think it's pretty awesome that the both the Dest and Eve communities have such a good tie with the developers. I mean, it feels like most other games, you know, it's just a faceless entity, but we've got, you know, memes being created of our developers and that's pretty cool. Humanizes them a bit. And they usually, they're usually pretty good about poking fun at themselves too. And they, they do give as good as they get, I, I believe with the community. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that uh, sometimes there's, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of fun in, in the background. Um, just you know, interacting with the devs, um, like in the CPM channels, there's a lot of things that I, I would love to share just because they're hilarious and, and stuff that you know they get to kind of chill back a bit um, and kind of be you know people when they're not having to you know be put on the whole employee face. Yeah, lots of fun, lots of complaining, just like any other person in their situation would do. You know, it's uh, it's awesome working with them, but like Bam said, it's really nice to take a step back and realize, you know, they're just people having jobs just like the rest of us. You know what, what I liked about it was that they were nine times out of 10, they were on the side of the players themselves. It's just unfortunately certain things come to pass that they can't actually do what they need to do to please everybody. So, yeah. I think that's a pretty fair, uh, a pretty fair way to look at it too. I've, uh, I've had the the fortune to speak to a couple of guys that actually do some pretty interesting game work. Um, up at, when I lived up near the Seattle area uh, here not too long ago, that's absolutely just saturated with uh, game development companies up there. And I had a a pretty good pretty good friend of mine, a real life buddy of mine, that actually has worked on some AAA titles, like in the uh, kind of the game design s- sort of world. Um, and it, it, it is very interesting when you talk to them about what they go through to make a game, which which is pretty pretty uh, can be pretty harrowing. It's uh, it is not exactly a fun thing to do uh, on some occasions. And I think there's actually a web series called The Sprint uh, that was a, 
I want to say it was about Bungie putting together uh, one of the Halo games. And it's, it is definitely a full access look, you know, like guys walking around with cameras while they're trying to, uh, to put the game together and you get a real taste of, you know, it is, it is not all haha fun. You know, let's eat a lot of Cheetos and shoot them in the face for work kind of stuff. It's these, those dudes are slaving to get those games turned out. Uh, and kind of like Bam alluded to, and uh, so did Darth and, and Zell. There are, um, there are a lot of factors that have absolutely nothing to do with turning out a good game that affect what the end product looks like or when the end product comes out. So I, I and I'm, I'm pretty confident it's called the sprint. You can probably find it on YouTube. Uh, but it is a, uh, it's a pretty interesting little take on it. So I guess my other, my other opening gambit here, since, uh, we have hit our two major topics for the evening and we wanted to have a quick grab bag and kind of talk uh, about a few different things. I'll kind of open the floor up to anybody here in the, in the, in the channel. We've got quite a few guys playing different beta games or, uh, we're starting to get into the, uh, near holiday season as some games are actually starting to matriculate their way out to public use for the PS4. Uh, I'm just kind of curious what's on your guys' minds in terms of things you've been playing or things you've been watching and doing uh, that might be of interest to the uh, to the biomass audience. Uh, I'll kind of open it up with that. Uh, what have you guys been up to lately? Uh, I've been watching a lot of uh, a lot of gameplay um, for the new Assassin's Creed coming out. Um, uh, Syndicate, it's called. Um, there's a the guy his YouTube name escapes me at the moment, but he put out about an hour of. Um, a footage for it um the first couple of sequences and it the game looks amazing um but the the chemistry between you know the two protagonists um is something that you know i think the game was the series was missing for uh for a while um uh, probably since you know since the uh the Ezio series of uh of titles if if you're familiar with those the same you know the charm and um um snobbery well no not snobbery but um i know he's they're smug i guess is is a better word um so quite excited for that well, that's pretty cool the uh now that's the one correct me if i'm wrong like the setting is uh, uh late, late 1800s the, london yes uh industrial revolution um era london oh. yeah okay all right yeah i've i i actually just saw an ad for that um Gosh, you know, earlier this afternoon, and it looks pretty, pretty solid. Um, my wife actually is like, "Wow, I didn't even know they were still making Assassin's Creed <laughs> Creed games." Mm -hmm, yeah, uh, hopefully they'll end the series soon, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> well, they are working their way up in time, so we'll see. That's yeah. not too bad. Uh, let's see, Bam, you mentioned earlier that you were in in a beta as well. I think the uh, the Rainbow Six beta, right? Yes, I played the Rainbow Six beta. Yeah. Do, um, are you? Can you give us like your just initial thoughts? Because that's been like a topic of discussion uh, for two or three of us about. Because it. it looks pretty good, at least from what little we've seen. Like, what's your thoughts on the gameplay of it so far? Oh, don't get me wrong. I like the game. Um, I just don't think it's got a lot of replay value in it. That that's just my my thought of it. The the way I see it is that when it comes to developers putting betas out, like the one they did there, and it's that polished and that well done with the gun game gameplay and all that jazz. Uh, one person, in, in the UK anyway, one person has actually pre-ordered the game. And with that pre-order, you get five keys. So one key for the person who's on the pre-order and four for other friends. So really, it's um, Ubisoft who's, who's got to impress the other four friends to buy the game. And I don't think they've achieved that outcome this time. Um, I don't think there's a lot of replay value because I don't think there's... Um, enough reason to keep playing it once you've played a few game modes you've then played a few game modes and you're, you're done there's no story to it i mean they could have taken any of tom clancy's stories and cobbled together a story better than the battlefield 4 storyline ubisoft are known for their stories you know their backstories their histories and stuff like that so i'm surprised they didn't pull any out their ass for this one it's just an online game no i'm just gotta play do you, you know? is it um uh, now i'm gonna ask a dumb question here is it because do you know if the beta is just showing you part of it and they have an actual single single player kind of campaign that ha that you that you get when you actually when the game goes live, and this is really just about you know, tweaking the 
uh, you know, kind of the PvP aspect of it? No, there is player versus environment, and there is player versus player. The player versus player is violent and bloody, which is great because you have a good laugh, good giggle, and you quite literally get your 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 head shot off anywhere you go. The player versus environment is very difficult. It's very taxing, and it will take a long time to clean the build, clear the building if you're going to go lone wolf. And these guys, these they AI, they shoot to kill. They don't shoot to you know tickle you. Um, I had a good time playing the game. I won't lie there. Um, I just don't feel that I'm going to replay it, especially when they're bringing out another game called Division. Now that is yeah, something that, I'm very interested in. That, that does look like a game. I'm pretty. I'm pretty interested in that one. That is definitely a. Uh, uh, what looks to be like a, a pretty engaging longer term game it's it, there is some pvp in it but it's really a it, it looks like i mean it's looks it's not i mean it's kind of open worldy but it's got a lot of potential replay value at least the way that they're they're laying it out for people the, the way it was described to me was that it was dc for the ps4 now i know that for a fact that's not going to happen but it's interesting to think that ubisoft are thinking about something like that if indeed the division is actually going to be like that. No, I think that's a pretty pretty fair way to look at it. Anybody anybody play, played the uh, the Star Wars Battlefront beta? Yes, I oh, had yeah. a couple of friends who did. Anybody? Let's see. I think Bam, you've actually played it. Uh, anybody got impressions of it? I've I've heard like a mixed bag on it. To be honest with you, heard it was very meh. No, wrong. Well, okay. Wait, and, so says it, the guy named Darth it, Carbonite. <laughs> it was, it, it was, it was beautiful. Like the textures and stuff were the way it was described to me. Um, I, I haven't played. I don't have a PS4. I don't have a decent computer. But the way it was described to me was, it was, it is a very beautiful game. Um, obviously, if you've seen the screenshots, or if you, even if you've seen some guy on YouTube play, it's very beautiful game. Um, but there weren't like classes or anything. It was just one dude. Um, for the most part, um, and it it I, it was just meh. On the other hand, though, uh, for a person looking for maybe the ultimate Star Wars, uh, you know, fan service that has been in a game so far, they really nailed it. Uh, tone setting, the sound is perfect. Um, and if you're just looking for an escape from the uh, the high intensity of dust or the the long the uh, long marathon. Uh, Battlefront's great for a short sprint. That's pretty cool. That and that's actually kind of the way Bait described it is what I've heard. It looks, it's visually really, really good, and there are a lot of winks, nods, and nudges for kind of Star, Wars, you know, like actual big, big time Star Wars fans in there. But the gameplay itself was, um, you know, I, I mean, nobody said it was bad, but it was. It all the general impression I got was it was pretty unspectacular. That, does that, that make sense? Stripped down battlefield is what it was described to me as, or call of duty or one of the two. Okay. All right. Now it's, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely, right. well, obviously closer to battlefield than, well, yeah, you know, course, it's, it's, there are no surprises there. You know what you're getting pretty mm-hmm. much. It just has a really nice layer of star Wars. Oh yeah, dude. It looks friggin' beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool. I've uh, like the I've been ducking in and out of the Eternal Crusade. Uh, it's like the Warhammer 40k like MMO third person shooter game. I, I I will tell you, you know, I am fairly impressed with that so far. It is. I mean, there's still a lot of things that they've got to work out on it in terms of you know bugs and gameplay, but that is a a really 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 sharp looking game. Um, in, in terms of like the visual feel, if you're like a Warhammer 40k fan, they they really they really uh, have a lot of homage to to the setting and the backdrops of the game. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. The maps themselves are really well laid out. Like that's one of the you know one of the beefs we have in Dust is you know the maps are the maps and the maps drive gameplay in a certain way. Um, the way they have designed the maps in or at least the you know, the one map that I've seen, it is one, it's very large. And two, it, there is a lot of different tactical ways to play. Um, there are different objectives that are more, more or less suited to different styles of play or different types of characters. And, and there's always some kind of, um, there's always alternate paths, basically, if not like actual 
paths that you move on, there's alternate ways of taking an objective or, or achieving objectives, like when you're trying to uh, secure locations and things like that. So I, I've been very impressed with it so far. There's a couple, some clear weapon balance things that they need to work on. Uh, but that's like any game that, you know, that's in, in the process of getting built or post post build. But it, uh, I'm pleasantly surprised it looks pretty good so far. And again, if you want to see what it looks like, you can all, you can look them up. They put a Twitch out every week, and you can see the gameplay, uh, and it's pretty cool. Uh, you, uh, it, uh, I've been relatively impressed with it. Uh, and again, one of the things that is interesting, there's more than a few former CCP folks that are actually working on that game. Uh, in fact, the you know the EP is a guy that used to work on Dust way back in the day when, uh, you know, I think before CCP Jean. Um, but it, you can, it's, if you've played dust a lot and you're very familiar with it, you will see things in the game where you're like, wow, that looks like somebody who knew not to make something that, you know, like you'll, it's hard to describe other than there will be things in the game that will be like, wow, that looks like somebody played dust or had a hand in designing dust and said, well, I ain't going to do that way. Do that again, because it sucked the first time I tried it. Um, there's a few there's a few kind of points in there that you'll catch like that, particularly in the map design or a few other things. So let's see. Other than that, that's about that's about it. Uh, I am kind of monitoring the Kickstarter that uh, Hairbrain Scheme put out on their their BattleTech game. You know the old old uh, old tabletop that then morphed into Mech Commander and Mech Warrior for a lot of us PC gamer crowd. You know that's a very ven- you know, venerable IP that's out there, and they are starting a. Uh, they've got a vi- right now an extremely successful Kickstarter going for a BattleTech uh, sort of turn-based game, uh, very similar to kind of their what they did with Shadowrun, where they basically revived that IP. Um, that's it's owned by the you know, the guy that owns Hairbrain Schemes owns. He like created both those IPs, so he's reviving that one, similar to how he did Shadowrun and. That looks like that might end up being a, a pretty, a pretty special game uh, potential. They they have a very good track record of delivering exactly what they say in Kickstarter. Uh, HBS has a, a pretty interesting Kickstarter method where they already have a budget for a game. They've already funded a game out of their own operating funds, and what they come to the Kickstarter table with is, okay, uh, if if we get this much money, we will we we can then secure more assets and time to do these other features. So the core game is already, the way they do it, they have already got the core game basically paid for out of their operating funds and they're going to produce it one way or the other. How cool, how much coolness or how many different things they can hang on the game or bake into the game is where the Kickstarter comes in. It's a really neat business model that I've seen some other games are starting to look at trying uh, because right now they're batting they're batting a thousand. They are knocking it out of the park with every game they've put out uh, using this model. So uh, that's a kind of a homegrown Seattle thing. Very, very keen to see how the, how those guys over at HBS do with that. Uh, and I think that kind of rounds up the sort of around the horn news that we had for gaming and kind of what we've been doing lately. Uh, we, let's move into shout outs. And if you guys have anything you want to put on the table or whatever during your shout out, throw it out there. We'll have a quick kick around at it and then we'll keep moving. So let's see, Sarazel, what do you think, man? Any shout outs or last minute topics? Yeah, you picked a you picked a bad time, but um all right. So um what I've been doing and I'm actually doing right now, um, is uh I've been playing uh Wildstar, which is um kind of a more of a sci fi and a little bit lighter tone kind of World of Warcraft type uh, MMO. Um and it recently went free to play, so I've been messing with it. Um, it's kind of nice. Um, the, the big thing that that makes it, I would say, different than the normal MMO is that it's uh, more target based than, or more AOE based rather than target based. You don't point and shoot. You everything's an AOE, so it's a bit more interesting as far as um, positioning matters more. Okay. All right. That's pretty cool. Um, let's see. So, is that your new fix instead of Heroes of the Storm, or is it? I play Heroes of the Storm too. I, okay. You know, I vary it up. It's a different, a very different type of game. So you know, it you it doesn't fit every need. You know, that's fair. That's fair. Um, Bait, what do you got, man? 
Uh, to give a shout out to uh, Insurgency, the uh, uh, the team who makes that slips my mind at the moment. Uh, I've been playing a lot of that recently. Um, good times if you're looking for a for a tactical shooter, very tactical. Um, it's, it is a pretty fun game. It it can be frustrating as shit. It's hard, but it's it can it be is. very fun. Oh my god, yeah, it it can be. Yeah, it it's very hard if you're especially if you're not playing with a a proper mouse um, and you're playing with a with a trackpad like I am. Um, but nothing a couple of key binding changes won't fix. Very fun game. Highly recommend it. It's um, fifteen bucks on Steam right now. Um, very good game. Okay. All right. Yeah, I can de- I can personally attest that's a fun one. Uh, bam, shout outs or last minute topics? Uh, yeah, just about the uh, first one. I believe it's New World Interactive or something along those lines who make Insurgency. I'm not too sure. I just I've played that as well for a bit. Um, yeah, shout out to the uh, inter- if anyone from CCP Newcastle listened to this uh, Biomass podcast. Thank you very much for the pints, guys. Love you long time. Five dollar sucky sucky. Yeah, well. Um, <laughs> if you guys have any questions about the. Uh, about uh, anything, happy to ask, answer them, you know, with the reason. No problems, guys. Thank you very much for having me on the show, and I uh, will definitely be um, back for more. Absolutely. A bit more bacon, a bit more beer around, but right now I'm tired. It's like four in the morning. I'm dead. No, nah, no, nah, I hear you, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Darth Carbonite, any shout outs or last minute uh, drops you want to put on us? Uh, well, the big thing is that the uh, desk team is back in the office this Monday, and they are aware of all the issues people have been having, black screens, major lag, and they're looking for a, a fix. Um, apart from that... Hashtag uh, both of for. Indeed. Hashtag. Well done. Uh, besides that, though, shout out to the Carolina Panthers for proving the doubters wrong and really bringing it to the Seahawks. Okay, this will be the last time we have Darth Carbonite on the show for a while. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> No, no, you, you laugh. They were like, I, like we did a show the night of the Super Bowl when the uh, when the Seahawks lost. They uh, were like, I am. Um, normally, I can be pretty calm and fairly unemotional about that that kind of stuff, but it was the wrong night to be poking on me. <laughs> um, okay, Mr. Menaheim, what do you got? Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Ashtarathi and Elsie Randolph for their input on the skill uh, transfer system. Yeah, good deal. Yeah, I saw Ash going back and forth with you a little bit on that. That was actually pretty cool. He's, he's a good dude, by the way. Really good guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. For I have a question. Yep, What's a ahead. Super Bowl? Is it like a really big cereal bowl or something? Does it have soup in it? <sighs> it's the equivalent of the Is FA Cup. What the or the, the, FA the, the, um, the the fucking thing that they do in the, uh, in the Premier League. That's the what? FA Cup, right? What's it's, the premier? But I don't watch that, football in the UK. I don't oh, watch football in America. You're not one of, the, you're, I, I, you're not one of those UK World football Rally teams. Championship, okay. Formula One. Those are the sports I watch, dude. I don't watch this. It, it, okay, it, it, it's thing. like the fucking. It's like the fucking uh, World Championship for F1 or whatever the fuck. Le Mans. Is it a world championship for American football? I, I thought the Americans only played football. <laughs> hey, let's. Okay, this not is not a world championship, but okay. national. So let's. Let, let us let us all all realize that there is still one superpower in the world and one only. Therefore, American football is the world's game of football. There's another game called soccer, <laughs> which is a derivative of American football, and we allow the the on, folks wait, wait, around wait. the world to play that game because they aren't <laughs> technically capable of playing American football. Hang so on, isn't here, American let's... football like a derivative of rugby that was created in a town called rugby by some dude randomly picked up a ball and ran to the end of the field? <laughs> Yeah, I acknowledge that William Webb what? Ellis was one of the forebearers of rugby, which was something that people were trying to figure out how to develop a game like American football, and that was their first proto step in doing it. Ah, right. <laughs> so American football came before. Oh, I see now. Thank you for educating it's, me. It's, I am so now learned it. R- rugby is like was like the open beta for American football. <laughs> Way more intense. I get it now. Intense. I'm understanding. I'm understanding this. Yes. I, I'm, 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 I've, I'm going full kung fu right now to try to defend this one. The, uh, no, and actually, I, I have a lot of, I poke a lot of fun of that. I, I played uh, uh, rugby union for a very long time. I was on a travel squad over in Asia for a long time. I, was, I thoroughly enjoy rugby. 
uh, rugby union, rugby league, eh, eh, not as much. Uh, sevens is a great, great way to show exactly how slow I am. So I try not to play that game too much, but, uh, is what it is. Okay. So I really don't, I really don't have too much in the way of shout outs other than I do appreciate everybody coming on the show tonight. And we do appreciate the dust audience. I want to give one quick hook back to CCP Retidy for being a really good sport. He, he has come on the show, uh, I think three times now. And, um, he is again, a very good sport. He will take pretty much every question. And even when I kind of went into the, so talk to me about this whole, like, uh, you know, while we still on the PS3 thing, he took that in stride and, and, uh, he answers the questions as best, as best he can. So I, I give him that one. Uh, and again, for those of you that still play CCP games and, and enjoy CCP products and IPs, th- keep at it, you know, have a lot of fun with it, you know, make your choices as a customer and a gamer as you will. And, uh, we will continue to kind of what broaden the shot group of what the biomass website and the biomass podcast is to to cover other things too because we are all gamers but you know we will always keep everybody up to date on the latest things going for uh, eve online and for dust obviously since that is sort of what kind of got us off the ground all right folks with that uh we're going to go ahead and bring this one to a close and as always good night and good luck port dust 514